Okay, well, we'll begin. Uh, we're a small number today, but thank you for being here. We have some, uh, we have some, uh, some viewers online as well, so we're not just, uh, we're not limited to this group. There's, there, is a, there is a body of listeners there. Welcome and thank you for being here. Um, it's great that you're joining us today for this conversation between our two amazing guests, Dr. Abdullah Niang and Rai Moran. Um, my name is Kirk McNally and I'm an Associate Professor of Music Technology in the School of Music here at the University of Victoria. This event, titled Turn It Up, Music, Citizenship, and Social Change, is a culmination of almost a year's work and effort to get Dr. Niang to Canada and to UVic. Abdullah actually presented uh, in this room via Zoom to an audience in November for a small conference that I organized with my colleague, Dr. Amadine Pra. I know Amadine is joining us online today, so uh, bonsoir, Amadine. Um, We've both been saying just how nice it is and how much more meaningful it is to have Abdullahi joining us in person today. So first, a big thank you to Abdullahi for agreeing to this crazy adventure and for being here today. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to uh, also acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen people on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich people whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. For me, this territorial acknowledgement reminds us of the responsibility that we have to the land where we each live and asks us to engage with the history and people who come from these lands in order to make a better future. The format for our event today includes two presentations of about 50 minutes each. We will begin with Dr. Abdullah Niang's presentation and then take a short pause while we switch over and then Rai Moran will present. We'll take a 15 minute intermission at that time and return for a round table and discussion and Q&A with, with our audience members that I'll be moderating. So our guests, Dr. Abdullah Niang is a teacher researcher in the Department of Artistic and Cultures Occupations at the Université Gaston Berger de Saint-Louis in Senegal. Dr. Niang was awarded a PhD with distinction at the University Gaston Berger in 2010 for a thesis entitled Social Integration and Professional Insertion of Young B-Boys Through the Hip-Hop Movement in Dakar. His prior affiliations and visiting sessions as a guest lecturer include Cape Town University, Northwestern University, Rutgers University, and Harvard University. His research interests include youth, social change, social movements, music and creative industries, the use of information and communication technologies, social use of digital technology, identities, urban culture, and the theories and methods of the social sciences. Our second guest, Rai Moran, is Canada's inaugural Associate University Librarian Reconciliation at the University of Victoria. Rai's role within the UVic Library focuses on building and sustaining relationships to introduce Indigenous approaches and knowledge into the daily work of the libraries and more broadly across the campus community. Rai came to this position from the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation hosted by the University of Manitoba. As the founding director of the NCTR, uh, Rai guided the creation of this, of this uh, centre from its inception. Rai also served with the Truth and, Recon Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. On the TRC's behalf, he facilitated the gathering of nearly 7,000 video and audio recorded statements of former residential school students and millions of pages of archival records. Rai's lifelong pas passion for the arts and music continues to be an important part of his life, and he continues to write and produce original music. Rai is a distinguished alumni of the University of Victoria, and was awarded a Meritus Service Cross by the Governor General. Rai is also a proud member of the Red River Métis. I would like to uh, say some thank yous. First of all, to the Orion Fund in Fine Arts for their generous support of today's and this week's activities with Abdullahi, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and our international partners on this event, the Afternoon Partnership. This partnership is directed by Dr. Emmanuel Olivier from the EHESS, the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences, with funding from the French Research National Agency. This partnership brings together 14 researchers, two non-academic sound engineers, four PhD students, and six master's students from Canada, Ivory Coast, France, Ghana, Mali, and Senegal. 
I will now turn things, turn things over to Dr. Abdullah Niang for his presentation, and please join me in welcoming him. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm very happy to be here today. After so many travels with, <laughs> you know, the, the Canadian authorities and for traveling and for getting the visa. But I'm here. Okay. So I would like to thank, uh, before going any further, uh, some persons who really contribute a lot uh, to my stay here in Canada. Of course, you have Kirk here, you have Emmanuel Olivier, and you have also Amandine Pra. They really did a lot to make it possible. So thank you guys for that. Uh, having said that, um, I also feel really very pleased to share this conference with Ray Moran. We already started a, a wonderful conversation <laughs> and yeah, it's really good to have this opportunity, you know, to, to live on it. So today, um, I would like to share with you uh, some aspects of my research, which is uh, very devoted to the links that exist between the youth in Senegal, the urban cultures, and the commitment to bring social change. I will at a certain level also uh, evoke a number of examples um, outside of Senegal because there is also something very important to, uh, to observe and to, to note is the fact that actually uh, in Africa there is a major trend all around the continent and it consists of having all these young people that try to organize themselves as a powerful movement, you know, to just make Africa great again. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> okay. <laughs> because for them, Africa was already great in the past. And there is no reason that we cannot do it again, okay? So I will sometimes also try to explain how these links are being built from a country to another. Not without problems, of course, because you know what is happening in Africa is sometimes so hurt, but they are doing their things. So I will not like do a kind of very academic presentation. Uh, I will focus my presentation uh, by using a lot of videos. <laughs> And from that videos, we, I hope, gonna be able to, to discuss. So I, I would like also to really have the time to, to discuss with you about this presentation. Uh, usually I, I love to, to start with uh, some kind of concepts that are not from me, but developed by the artists themselves. And these artists, these African artists, are defining themselves as a, like the voice of the voiceless, the hidden camera, okay, the deputy of the people, and the use to precise that the real deputy of the people to make a difference <laughs> with the official deputies, okay, that they don't recognize. So why a hidden cam? Why deputy of the people? Why voice of the voiceless? Because for them, in all the African societies, I, I'm, I'm gonna say, all the African countries, you still have this wide range of people who are not integrated economically and so, who are a kind of big majority in terms of demography, but who are at the same time what we call in sociology, 
a kind of uh, sociological minority. When we talk about sociological minority, it means that you don't have uh, a lot of power, you know, to bring this change. And the term like, terms like uh, mission uh, indicates a lot that they are conceiving their roles very seriously. And should I say maybe more, they are not only talking about mission, they are talking about a sacred mission to say that, okay, for them, there is no single reason to get committed in music, in graffiti, in dance, if with this art, you are not able to represent your people. So art is depending to a, like, more important, you know, really more important objective, which is representing your people. Art is here just a kind of platform for achieving something bigger than art. And it led us back to this kind of, you know, big movement that we had uh, within the American society during the 1950s and 60s that you probably know. It was about black power movement. And there is a strong link between the black power movement and the black arts movement in the U.S. And it wasn't only in the U.S., of course. If you take um, some, you know, some of these uh, activists like uh, uh, Ed Berlin's, like Larry Neal, and for Larry Neal, I mean, it's very clear. He, he, he had a kind of very seminal work on, on the, what, what is supposed to be, you know, this is black arts movement. And he said that, okay, we are not here. It's a very clear for us, we are not here just to do or to practice art. We are here to use this art as a powerful way to change the social conditions of Afro-Americans and the whole black people in the diaspora. So this is a kind of uh, constant uh, situation that is maybe uh, all the, even than this period of black ass movement because you also got it in a little bit uh, during the Garveyism uh, during the 1920s and so, okay? So this kind of uh, conception about art as a tool for bringing change is against another view about art which, uh, which you see it as something that you have to do only for uh, aesthetics reasons. You, you, you all know when, what it means when you hear about arts for art's sake. So it is exactly the contrary that you will get with the hip hop movement. There is no arts for art's sake. There is arts for fundamental reasons other than the aesthetic ones. And to, to show some examples from that point, uh, there, is a, there is a lot, there are a lot, but <laughs> we have to choose. So I'm, I'm gonna show uh, different video clips and you will probably see that there is a kind of a variety uh, of situations, but there is still something common beyond this variety of situations. It is this strong will really to bring something to your society, to your communities, okay. I have here some artists like books, DJ Awadi, Usaino and Akasan, Human, Simon, Kirgi, etc., etc. They are all Senegalese people, but I have also as examples from other African countries like Smokey in Burkina Faso, like Zara Musa in Niger, uh, like uh, Sheikh MC uh, in uh, Comores Island, and so and so, or Valsero in, uh, in Cameroon, uh, Sam Mazeste Wahams in Mauritania, etc. So, um, yeah, I love this picture, but 
<laughs> because it summarizes a lot of things. But I, I will come back to this, to this big. For the moment, I just would like to start with the music because we are in, in the fine arts, right? <laughs> so let's play the music. <laughs> stop from time to time, you know, to, <laughs> to give some explanations. Okay, first, you can already distinguish the sound of the kora, uh, which is a kind of, uh, some people call it uh, African harp, okay? Uh, so it is a, an instrument which is uh, like very representative of the African, of the African music, West uh, African music, okay? And there is something to say here, but I will come back again on that. Just for the moment, let's keep on mind that even this use of African instrument, you know, is very meaningful in terms of claiming your identity, your African roots, okay? And then you have another sign which is very evocative, representing here the flag of Senegal, vert uh, jaune rouge, so the, the colors, yeah, okay? And it is all about citizenship, all about that, okay? Jim not the de Muno Manello, Gumu Muno Manello, Good the Melingello, from a guest to Muno Mahello, books. Wayma Wayma, Jimmel Jimbo Roma, Volcarbo Magata, and they saw the Jelsa Halima Joyma, to a Jimmo Muna say, Why Jeff to Gadai, Leru say to Nuru Bamba, by Nasak by Lai. Mori jab less and all, while Jojo Kaiwai, and they pronounce me Jotna Amka now, La Jor Alburin Jai. By you said you many anta, Shak Job di Santa, Carbon Tator, Samuan Yepa Amganta, Yarama Kaita Fanta, Chatola Topo Fanta, Dinan Lanyana, Dinan Sahola La Lapanta, while you go to many palai, Juf Maki di Sangai, do ten young is sumped, selling salu to in a kirai. Nunye defak serin masur tijan numu tise Nunye defak amati mamur imam asan sise I dread the days that come when we will part I know them days will happen from the start Because we live to die and die to live So until the day I go it's love I'll give Jarawla ke Sherafal, lu tak ke Yahutal, Jafal Sunimbag, ajar fukawe Senegal, sen falu fal na fal, kangam you can do kal, sen afia sen modu buso jengle nyamti hal. Deux mille deux, elle a du fuck pour un calambe. Deux mille deux, Ali fal. Okay, so he's talking about different things, but all these things are related to very crucial periods for for Senegal in terms of sports in terms of religion, um, in terms of politics, and so and so. So in the, in the first part, it was like uh, celebrating uh, uh, how we should be proud of our country because we have all this heritage uh, from these people who are really great, okay? In terms of sports, you have like, uh, he's, he, was, he was evoking Elaj Youf was a team a member of the team who, who defeated France at 2002. That was a kind of big symbol that went far from only the sport, of course, because France is a former <laughs> colonial <laughs> country that you know that was dominating Senegal, and Senegal uh, France was defeated by Senegal. Okay, so it was a kind of very important moment uh, for for us. Uh, for the, the, the religious guides also, he's evoking uh, some Sufi brotherhood uh, leaders. Because in Senegal, it's very common, in Mali also, okay, and in Guinea, to have this kind of Sufi brotherhood. In French, we, we call them confrérie. Uh, so you have the Mouridia, which was founded by Sheikh Ahmed Bamba. And it is also a very important reference because Sheikh Ahmed Bamba was considered as a, as a danger by the colonialists. 
So he was exiled for years before having the right to, to come back to, to Senegal. He was exiled to Mauritania, to Gabon, and so and so. So uh, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba is seen as a kind of pacific resistant, okay? He never took weapons, but in terms of symbol, he's very important in the Senegalese imaginary about resistance, okay? And you have the politics also. So he's like uh, quoting or mentioning different personalities uh, who are very important for uh, the, the Senegalese history, okay? But then you have uh, another part in which he's criticizing, not directly, but he is. He's gonna talk about the prison system, okay? He will talk uh, about the fact that uh, the health system is very bad for people in our country, which is really true. And you have this kind of like uh, parallel between really what is great and what is absolutely not no great. But the conclusion is, we, okay, we have some sites that, that are really very dark, but we have a, a great history. So let's take this great story to build an, a, a better future. So you're gonna use this, this heritage to be able, you know, to go really uh, forward. So all these problems are here, but let's just remind us that, okay, we have enough mental resources to, to overcome these, these problems. So it's not this kind of uh, track, uh, which are quite very hard, very harsh, but it is very meaningful in terms of trying to raise this, this consciousness of citizenship for Senegalese people, okay? I would like to show you another example of still these video clips going around this idea of, of citizenship. So, this one is a bit harsher than the first one. And it was created... Senegal. It was created uh, during, let's say, um, a kind of electoral campaign. It wasn't like a an, um, an, an, an classical election, but it was a referendum that uh, aimed to change the constitution. It was quite funny because usually when you have a referendum, it's about one point, right? And you have to say yes or no. But for this one, it was 15 points, 15 points. Okay, how can you ask to someone to say yes or no to 15 different questions. <laughs> okay? That's completely a mess, of course. So they did this track to talk about it. And this guy that you are seeing is unfortunately our president. Yes, <laughs> unfortunately. Oh, okay. Yeah. I can't touch anything here. <laughs> I'm waiting to my boss. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, like, like, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, but then you lose everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's wrong. The first one was better. <laughs> but maybe. Uh, that's, uh, unfortunately, I think that's what my options are. <laughs> He's talking about other options in your right. On the wall? I'm not sure. Yeah, he's I think they're all controlled oh. by the same. Hmm? They're all controlled by the same. The same? No, I think they're all controlled by the same. If we're okay, I don't have, hold on. No, no, okay. no, you got to go there. Mm -hmm. No, I can't do it. That's it. You can go to. Oh. Uh, <laughs> the other one was better. The other one's better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's my options. Sorry, folks. Sorry, so, sorry about that. <laughs> we have to, to manage with this one. Okay, so uh, I, was, I was trying just to, to put this. Um, so it was the, around 2016, 2015, 2016. So they, the, 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 the real reason behind this referendum was the will 
for this president to extend, I mean, okay, let me put it in this way. Uh, when he, he tried to, to get the power uh, against Abdullah Awad, the former president, and they were in the same party, political party, so there is a whole story behind their clash, but anyway, he was promising that he gonna reduce, you know, the duration of the term. The term was about seven years, and then he promised that he gonna reduce it to, to five years, okay? When he started, uh, when he, he was in, on, in business, he started his term, and we got close <laughs> to the end. He was like, uh, okay, you know, I have promised that I will be sticking on my promise. Okay, I'm gonna just do five years, but the Constitutional Council told me that in terms of law, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go until the seven years. And the referendum was about, all about that, okay, to have a term of five years. But he, he put within these points so many things. But the real, real stake was about, you know, this term, okay? So they did this video clip uh, to talk to Senegalese people. As for the first video clip, you're gonna see a lot of references you know, related to this idea of citizenship. And for instance, uh, especially you're gonna see the flag. You're gonna see different people, you know, with a flag. You're gonna see these same colors, uh, green, yellow, and red, etc., etc. et cetera. Uh, that's, just, that's something really constant. And if you look at to this- It's Senegal. Uh, it's just, this, is, this clip is showing basically a very ordinary uh, Senegalese family, okay? In which every, every, everyone is, is watching the television, okay? And they're gonna use it as a, a way for them to say, okay, the president has already uh, delivering his speech. Now it's our turn now. It's gonna be something very different, okay? What? from what he said. Message du 31 décembre 2015. Je vous avais entretenu du projet de révision de la Constitution. Constitution Constitution. Okay, I have to explain. So the title first is Dead and Dead. In my language, dead it means no. Normally, when you have a referendum, it is yes or no. Here it is no or no, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so they just explain that in all cases, okay, just say no, but even though you say no, you will not have really what you want. But no here maybe is less bad, I don't know, than, than, than yes, but nothing is, is good here, okay? So no and no, say no to anything. <laughs> And you see here's a flag, okay? If it transume, est-ce que n'y a Okay, say, content ngati maki. No. Tech such you ndawi, by you magi. Yes. Wow. Such, it means um, the chiefs. So he's asking, uh, are you satisfied with the president? And the other guy say, no. Why? Because he's a. Uh, putting in prison the little, you know, little bastards, and the very big chiefs, it means the guys from the government and this kind of people, they are free. So can you be happy with that? The guys say, no, absolutely no. Take such you, Ndawi, buy you Magi. Nyingi transime, eske nyong lendi, honal. Transime, transhumance in French, it says, I'm still trying to, to get this in English. It is still hard for me. But it is a kind of, <laughs> when you have um, a migration, for instance, for, uh, of the animals, okay, trying to get better food, when uh, a place is getting dry, for instance. So the animals are trying to migrate to, to find something better, okay? But 
this migration that uh, is evoked here is not about animals, but about politicians in Senegal. And we call it uh, political migration. <laughs> it's like you are supposed to be in the opposition, but when you lose the elections, you are joining the majority. It's something very usual in, in Senegal. So they are also denouncing this kind of situation in terms of politics. Okay? Opposant yang gira bas fest del Maki aku wada danyo nuro Lai dafa wak waket Maki dafa tef wak waket Wak wakat wakat ti waket Okay, this is very contextual what he's saying now. He say, do you think that, sorry, Wad and Maki are similar? Wad was a former president before Maki. He said no. And why? Uh, what already lied to us? The, the guy said yes, but Maki lied to us two times. <laughs> so uh, they are not similar. The one, it was one liar, but this one is at least two major liars. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay. I mean, just saying in Senegal that a president is lying is just not conceivable. You cannot say this. It is not possible. They did it by that they did not only this. They said something like less acceptable in Senegal, uh, but they were kidding about that. He said, Sangawah mak dafay meo. Meo is a kind of street word very dirty steed word to say to someone that you are lying. But even to put it in a correct word, you cannot do it normally in Senegal. So they did more than really what any average Senegalese people would dare to do by saying that the president is lying. Okay, maybe in Canada you can say it. In Senegal we cannot. But they are not only saying that he's lying, they are saying it in a certain way by using very provocative terms, okay? And that's something really important to mention. Press B, Sanya Def Critic, it's about the media. Do you think that the journalists would be able really to, to be critical with this power? He say no. Okay, he's rhyming, right? But critic, it is about being critical. A dick, it is a division des investigations criminal. It is a kind of special police. That the power, the majority, is using a lot to neutralize, okay, her, his uh, political adversaries. So dick is a kind of really tool, a political tool, between their, in, in their hands, and they are using it, really. So it is, yeah, something that, uh, that shows also that what they are doing actually is, um, is a, a, a great risk. And yeah, sometimes it, it can end very bad. Um, just one thing to, to mention, uh, we have several artists in the continent who were put in prison. And if I have time, I will come back to, to this. So it's not just about criticizing. You should be aware, and they are, that when you are criticizing, okay, you can really get a very, very bad backlash from the power. I will try to show another example uh, that illustrates also this kind of posture uh, from the rappers. Uh, they are still here, not only during, but uh, more maybe when you have this kind of particular periods like the, the, the electoral campaigns. They are still here to produce some specials, okay, release to remind people that it is important to use their rights as citizens. So the first one was a referendum 
during 2016. The second one that I'm going to show you was during the end of 2018. Okay, because I, yes, the presidential, uh, the presidential elections was at March 2019. But this one, uh, I'm going still more far. This one is harsher than the, 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 the last one. Uh, and it is uh, from a well-known crew, uh, very involved in, uh, in citizenship, not only in Senegal, but they are very well known in Africa uh, as a continent, uh, which is the Yanamar movement. So these guys are founding members of this movement, Kirgi crew. And they did this track. Uh, it was threat for the president and for his uh, allies, okay? You leg it up now. Ah, so I'm going to get it. To Bobby, you need a lip, you need a gay, you need a yet. I'm such net at all. I don't belong. Rien, nada. Rien, I submit. So it is uh, like the. Uh, the usual, uh, um, I don't know if I can say landscape or kind of decor that is used by the president when he is like delivering a, a speech to, to the people. So he used exactly uh, the same, <laughs> you know, uh, but it's going to be a very different speech, of course. So you have all these symbols around, still the flag, still you have it, still, to remind us that, yeah, we are here about you know rising consciousness on citizenship. And you have the lion, which is a kind of emblem for, for Senegal, of course. And you have this still also, it's all about hip hop, uh, this witticism. Um, more meaningful if you are, you are comfortable with French. Discours de la nation, discours de la nation, c'est discours, it is the speech, okay? But here you have like 10 lessons Ten lessons about the nation and speech for the nation, okay? And these ten lessons are going to turn uh, around the fact that, okay, these guys are here for themselves and for their allies from Western countries, okay? You have to end this. This is exactly the message here. And all they're going to say here is about it, okay? We are going to the elections, please don't forget that they did this, they did this, they did this, okay? And we have to, to change the situation. Tout la dent, cette année, nous perdons une temps qui bille banditisme d'état sans précédent. It's going to be hard to translate, but I'll <laughs> try. Cette année, nous perdons une temps qui bille banditisme d'état. Cette année, it is seven years that we are wasting our time with this official gangsters, banditism data, uh, I'm not sure that I'm translating correctly. <laughs> but this is this kind of idea. It is, our officials are just gangsters, okay? This is a kind of big mafia. And we are wasting our time with these gangsters, okay? Because they have no morality. Même triant, même fainéant, même incompétent. All these people that you can see in his left side are very well known in Senegal. They are political leaders. And they left their own political parties, or they say that they are still there, but they are joining the, the majority, okay? So this one is a part of this. E e everyone they are showing here. Comment on this. Uh, remember, we were talking about um, political migration, right? To try to, to find better um, meals, I don't know how to say it, okay? Uh, and here, uh, this monkey is representing the political leaders who are approaching the president to get something to eat, okay? So it is, yeah, it's a big caricature, and yeah, I love it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
certain ways of uh, expressing. I mean, you can even tell the truth, but you have to tell it uh, in a more, in a like polite way, especially when you are young. Uh, it's very complicated if you are very, you know, straight. Uh, and that was a problem here for for a part of the Senegalese, uh, the Senegalese audience. It was okay, yeah, they are right, but uh, we think that they cannot say to the president that he is a, he is a liar, even though he is a liar, of course. But you cannot say it. So it is a kind of cultural matters. Okay, in other cultures, it is much more easier to to say it. But in Senegal, it is still a big problem. And the rappers, in general, I mean, it is not only this particular example, have more and more recognition from the average Senegalese guy. Where they have problems often is how they are expressing. It's where they can have some, uh, Senegalese people have some discomfort with this way of expressing very freely. But this way of expressing very, uh, really, uh, sorry, I'm mixing French and English. This way of expressing yourself very uh, freely is uh, an aspect, an important aspect of the hip hop culture. So these guys are in a kind of intercultural situation where they have to mix uh, cultural traits from hip hop and cultural traits from, from Senegalese cultures. And sometimes it doesn't work very well. And it is sometimes also a problem for, for them just to, to get hurt. But what is more important to, 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 to mention here is the fact that this recognition, which wasn't uh, real at the beginning, now is very, very real. But the only problem is the way that they're expressing. Okay. And uh, I, I could show as examples, okay, but just maybe one or two last. Uh, if you take this one too, Yate. Assalamu alaikum. It's the same thing. It is about the president. And for this one, I, I was lucky because I was there in the studio when Simon was doing this, was doing the, the record. Uh, so I, I was witnessing everything. And he was, he was discussing the, with me and telling me that, okay, I, I don't know. But I, I think that I'm, I'm going to try to, it was during February, and the, the, the date was very close to Valentine's Day, okay? So he was like, I'm, I'm going to talk to the media, and I will let them know that I'm writing a love letter to the president. So all the majors in Senegal was writing, oh, Simon is a traitor, okay, because he's a member of Yanamar. He's known as someone who is very hard against, you know, the politicians. But it was for creating a kind of buzz to give more room for his sound. So everybody, everyone was waiting for the sound. <laughs> and when it was released, of course, it wasn't a letter of love. Not at all. <laughs> so here is a video clip. And this guy is representing the president, and there is the other one who came and said, oh, excellence, extra, I'm bringing you, uh, uh, what is this expression again? A political migrant, okay? And the president was asking, yeah, who is it? It is Simon. Really, Simon? So the president looks very excited and everything, but when Simon came in, okay, it was another deal. Alaikum salam. Excellent. Ça va? Ça va, Alhamdulillah. Ça va, Alhamdulillah. He's not even asking a lot of a lot of money because usually when they're coming, they're expecting something. But this one, he just wants to talk to you. 
Wow. Indico, indico, nenhum, nenhum, nenhum. Ainda, indico. Tá com a sua excelência. Defanula neriatei. Damane. Defanula neriatei. Crazy. Defanula neriatei. Dengue ni won senk ngay def mudu def set ya tay. His body language, he is literally changing because. As soon as he started, he, he started with this. You promised to do five and you're doing seven, so you were lying. And he, yeah, he was like. <laughs> and <laughs> this, this clip uh, is also in the same ways, more or less, than the others, still trying to point out one thing. I'm here as a kind of, you know, guardian of our consciousness. We have to, to, to get. To, to stay focused on the fact that these guys are ruining our country. And when it comes to go to the elections, they are still trying to act as if nobody happened before. So I'm here to remind you that a lot of things happened. I'm here with you citizens to remind you, okay? Don't lose it on your mind. <laughs> Talking about the fact that the president said that he will never, never appoint his little browser, what he did finally. Okay, so you have all these uh, facts that you cannot deny. So it's just about fact. And the very last one this time. Or oh, do I have some five minutes more? Yeah. Okay. This one is a. Uh, is quite interesting because um, it's about the occupation of land. And here it is mostly about the occupation of the, the beach along the, the sea, the ocean, sorry. Uh, because uh, more and more uh, we have people from the government, uh, let's say rich people, uh, whether they are from the government or from the, the business milieu, or a lot of also people uh, from abroad that are occupying, you know, um, the beaches. And it is more and more difficult for like ordinary people to access this. So this song is about that. I think it's very international. <laughs> uh, and what is important to mention here is you're gonna notice that you have uh, subtitles, okay, in French. And there is one good reason for that. For African rappers, sometimes, they, they, are, they are quite aware that when they are doing this kind of song, it is targeting some specific profiles, okay. For instance, the first songs was a lot about the Senegalese people. This one goes beyond. That's why they put this subtitle in French. Because they do know that also there is a international you know, uh, concern about that. And they are trying to sensitize at the, at the same, with the same um, song, uh, the, the international world. So you will see this. The first is it means I'll try to translate very quickly. Uh, I, I want to see the beach. Why he cannot see it? Because you have all these barriers now that prevent you, you know, from accessing the, the beaches. Badola Lenkesis, Badola, it means uh, the popular uh, classes, social classes, um, linguists, they don't want us as uh, low social classes to have the same opportunities as them, okay? Okay, it is our common good and so and so, okay? And 
you will see at the moment um, what if I don't know, tell. you see this picture it is a this very like um, young girl trying to see the beach <laughs> you see the image okay because okay it's just forbidden and she's trying just to to have a, a view of the beach it's not even question of you know being there it's only i mean even just seeing it is difficult you see this young lady trying to to have an overview and it's just impossible <laughs> Okay, now um, I have to be really in a rush, sorry about that, but something out of Senegal now, very quickly, I guess I got, I got it here. I guess, I guess, if I don't, okay, this one is from Burkina Faso. Uh, it is Smokey. Smokey uh, is very, very well known in Africa. He's a rapper and an activist. And he's a founding member of the, this activist movement, uh, Le Ballet Citoyen. They were very committed in um, making uh, Blaise Kampawari, who was the president during a long, long period, to live finally. And I have this chance to, to interview Smokey uh, a couple of months before they started the Ballet Citoyen. So I was there at Burkina Faso uh, at his studio, his studio, sorry, and he was talking to me about that. And some months after that, it was in 2014, uh, Bless Campare was obliged to leave the country, okay? But afterwards, the military tried to come in to, to take the power uh, with Yandere, General Yandere, and Smokey, who was like very active during these years, was targeted. And they have launched rockets on his studio. Yes, two rockets. It was destroyed. But it wasn't about the studio. They were trying to kill him. Yes. And they tried also to get the other guy, uh, some kids, yeah, because they were too, too found to, to create this movement. But uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, he escaped it, this, uh, uh, this danger, but yeah, it was very serious. They tried just to kill him. Uh, so he's doing here um, a clip still about this, this political African leaders and Puritil Noble, it is a kind of oxymoron because Puritil, it is a decay and Noble, you know what it is, okay, right? It is the same word in English, no? It is a kind of Noble decay. And it is an image uh, that it uh, uh, putting together. Uh, you have to, to watch the clip. I'm sorry, I will not have time for that uh, who, to, to see the, the, watch, um, the whole clip. But at the moment, the president was talking with one of his counselors, and he was like, yeah, you, you see the wine. Uh, with the wine, you have a pretty novel. Uh, it is a kind of uh, something that will bring this decay, but this decay is enhancing the taste of the wine. So it's like what I'm doing actually uh, while getting this money, <laughs> okay? Uh, a kind of sophisticated way to just say that, okay, this guy seems very noble, but he's just, he's just a decay. And this guy is the president, of course. <laughs> Pretty noble is the president. Vite avant qu'il ne me jette, faire un max de fric avant la retraite. La jeunesse attend de prendre ma place. <laughs> so, yeah, he said, uh, the young people are trying to take my position. But it's not a bus, it's a monoplace. <laughs> a monoplace, does it make sense? Okay. Uh, a vehicle with a single place. Okay, so he said it's not a bus. A bus is supposed to take a lot of fuel. So my position is a monoplace. <laughs> it means just that I'm going to be the only one to to be here for a while. Okay, and just just this image of the young guy trying to <laughs> to come to sit and yeah, just being tricked. <laughs>
veux plus faire ton nom la preuve C'est qu'à 50 en achetant des votes Je fais ma cure à tous les jours, il y a du monde Pour tout le monde, il y a toujours du monde Je dois garder mes potes, c'est pour les satisfaire Et le tas, c'est qu'il me reste à faire Okay, this is very interesting, really. I'm sorry that you ha don't have enough time, but it's like, quand le pays nourrit tout ce toi que j'aime, quand le pays va mal, ça fait monter mon capital. Okay. Uh, this image of him, like eating, uh, okay, it is a metaphor, of course. It is like he's eating what is literally, normally, for the whole population, but he's the only guy who is like using it, okay? Nourriture, that's what I love. Uh, I don't care about the others. Quand le pays va mal, when the country is suffering, it is rising my own wealth. So it's okay. They can die, they can do what they want, but I don't care. <laughs> okay. And so and so. Okay, so in, in general, what, what I try to show with these different uh, video clips, and we have other ones, but anyway, is the fact that you can easily see a number of common points. Uh, from a rapper to another one, and from a country to another one. And this is the kind of reason also that explains very well how these artists uh, are trying to, to create a kind of continental movement because the reason behind is that we all know that we have almost the same problems. So to solve these problems, uh, which are intracontinental, we're going to be more strong if we stick together. We have the same problems. Uh, we have to ruin it to be able like, to, to solve these problems. It's a common problem in Africa. And there is also a strong idea that, try, that they try to, uh, to use to convince people is the fact that, uh, I don't know what, what is the situation in Canada, maybe, yeah, we, we, I started really this conversation with you, but it's different with the situation here, as long as I have understood the situation here. In Africa, it's more about, we have, so many things in common. It's about Africa, let's talk about Africa, and let's put aside the differences. They are not as important as what is uh, common, what we have in common. So this is this big idea of we have so many things in common that, yeah, just let's create a, a very strong continental movement. And they already started, it's not, only a, like a, a vow, right? They are very effective in terms of creating this movement. And since 2016, you have this big platform called Afriki. I, I will end my presentation with this. And Afriki, sorry, I'm gonna be here, no, yes. I hope so. Yes, they have this platform since 2016. It was created in Senegal, uh, in Gore Island, I think, yeah? And since then, they are organizing what they call uh, IPEC, Université Populaire de l'Engagement Citoyen. So IPEC is kind of a popular uh, university for citizen commitment, okay? And uh, it, the first one was uh, organized in 2018, and the second one, uh, 2020, okay? And during this, uh, these meetings, they are inviting scholars, uh, other artists, all around, you know, Africa who are coming. And all you can see here is uh, different citizen uh, movements, like Ralebol in, um, what was the name of this country? Uh, Congo, okay? Uh, Feeling B, it is in DRC, so Democratic Republic of Congo, the other Congo. And uh, Wake Up Madagascar, very explicit. Jeune Effort, it is in Cameroon, okay. Ina, it is in Chad. Ina, it is a 
the Arabic translation of Yanamar. So Yanamar was at the forefront of this in Senegal, because Yanamar, it was at 2011. And uh, then you have Iina, which was created by using exactly the same, same name, but in Arabic. Oh no, sorry, not in 2011, in 2001, sorry, 2001. Yanamar is here. La Bale Citoyen, it is, yeah, this movement co-created by, by Smokey, that you just watched his, uh, his video. So it is a big thing, actually, and within this movement, this kind of uh, association of different African movements, uh, you have some personalities, uh, uh, like uh, Hajanin, Hajanin is from Burundi. He, she is very, very well known uh, all around the world. Uh, as an anecdote, she was a member of the committee for the Cannes Festival, which is very prestigious. Yeah, she, she was one time a member of this of this committee. Huh? Cannes Festival de Cannes. Yeah, for the movie. Yeah, yeah. So you have Hajanin, who is a she is a singer from Burundi. Uh, her father was a member of the government, okay, before exiling. And you have also, I still lose his name, uh, because I, I have in my mind Lucky Dube, <laughs> but this is not Lucky Dube. I, I, I guess I, I got it here. Okay, Tikan Jafakoli, who is a reggae uh, musician uh, from Ivory Coast. Uh, he's very, very well respected in Africa. He's constantly like uh, taking position publicly about Africa. Tiken uh, Fakoli, it is here. Oh, yeah. Hadja Nin, and you have like, oh, sorry. <laughs> you have Eli Kamano, he's, he's from Guinea. Uh, uh, I, I will end with this, uh, with this example of Eli Kamano, because it's quite, quite funny, sad but funny. Uh, in 2020 or 19, I don't, I, I was like in a team, an international team for organizing um, um, a traveling exhibition about rap as a revolution. So it was organized in Belgium. And I tried to get in touch with Eli Kamano, but at that time he was in prison. Uh, but finally, we, 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 we spoke. When he was in prison, I cannot tell you how, but <laughs> we did. Uh, and each time that I, I'm thinking about this, I mean, this exhibition, I, I still got it in mind. I mean, it's just like, finally, so ordinary. And this is a drama. I mean, in Africa, it is becoming ordinary to have artists in prison. And, and just just a big drama. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'd like to begin. Thank you, Abdullah, for that wonderful presentation. That was uh, excellent. And I know I, I certainly took a lot from that. And as we begin to think about this presentation that we're going to be working on, I think one of the things we can think about, and maybe we'll even discuss a little bit, is how we're going to see you know, collective accountability operating versus individual accountability. Because that was one thing that really stuck out in my mind. I think there's a lot of individual accountability that uh, I saw in, the, um, in, in your work there. So, so uh, yeah, my name's Rai. Um, I'm uh, the Associate University Librarian here, Reconciliation, and I'm going to be talking to you about music. We're going to take a kind of a long journey um, in a very short period of time through about 120 years of Canadian history or so, and how Indigenous music has been both uh, an integral part of healing and also actively suppressed by the Canadian state. Uh, we're going to be talking about residential schools as well throughout this. So, you know, it's, I don't know who's tuning in online, but sometimes some of this discussion is quite difficult 
So I will just encourage us to um, take good care of ourselves as we go through this process and to take good care of yourselves afterwards. And certainly if you need a break, I would encourage you to do so as well. So, um, yeah, my entry point into this is kind of twofold. Uh, for about the last 12 years or so, I've been deeply enmeshed in all of this work of truth and reconciliation here in the country. Um, I joined the Truth and Reconciliation Commission itself in about 2009, 2010, and after my time with the TRC, went on to start up the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Now that sort of interrupted what was uh, on silent here, a, a burgeoning uh, nascent music career, which uh, was unfortunately put on hold for a period of time. So there's me back when I had hair, uh, playing the guitar, and uh, still playing music. Um, but my life's work really has focused on this question of residential schools. So when we talk about residential schools, and we, we're going to be talking about you know, the interrelationship with music, one of the things that the residential schools are is a reflection of a set of particularly prejudiced ideas towards Indigenous peoples in this country. So here we're seeing this overall blanketing of the country with systems, structures, and sites of forced assimilation. Each one of these yellow dots represents a site of human rights violations. Each and every one of these sites represents a very concerted and direct effort to eliminate Indigenous cultures from these lands. Uh, beyond these 140 recognized institutions are a whole host of other uh, steps that Canada took to do this. Uh, day schools, separate, uh, separate um, systems of health care, legislation, creation of Indian reserves, uh, you name it, Canada's done it, and we're going to take a look at that. Fundamentally, one of the most uh, direct efforts that Canada undertook in regards to Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples, was the belief that Canada knew best uh, what Indigenous kids needed and inserted themselves right into the very fundamental relationship between parents and children. This here is a photograph of the uh, Kamloops residential school, which has become quite uh, notorious in the last year or so in the aftermath of the discovery of the 215 graves there. Uh, this particular photograph was taken in about 1920 or so. Um, I think it's really important to remember too that kids were not treated as kids. Um, they were in fact treated as criminals. So this is a uh, report from the RCMP uh, field reports in, in Alberta talking about kids uh, who were prisoners. Constable Pierce with prisoners Tommy Morning Owl, Bob Redhorn, and Matthew One Crow um, arrested for deserting from the Calgary Industrial School. So it wasn't just a matter of the state um, treating these children in awful ways. This was forced. This was conscripted. If you ran away, you were arrested and detained by the Canadian state and returned to that school and labeled a prisoner as a young child, right? As a, I don't know exactly the age of these kids, but they're probably in the age, you know, eight to 14 years old or so, especially given the era that this particular record comes from. So fundamentally, as, as, as religious institutions and as the Canadian state began to insert itself into the lives of Indigenous families, you began to see this um, very sort of twisted logic start to emerge out of the residential schools. And you see that Indigenous kids all of a sudden, by virtue of their, um, frankly, uh, white or religious instructors, were dressed up as caricatures of themselves rather than intact identities. Uh, and dressed up and made to play kind of make-believe um, as we went along. This all is grounded in and rooted in a set of really uh, fundamentally white supremacist or culturally superior notions that are, were, and uh, represent significant tax on indigenous cultures 
governance systems, legal orders, uh, lands, bodies, and identities. And this is where we get right into the conversation of music and how music uh, is actually recognized as being not only an integral part of culture, but a source of political activism, a source of political identity, uh, a source of cultural identity. And here we see that you know in the in the 1880s in the Indian Act we're um, passing legislation to ensure that uh, in the potlatch ceremonies that you know these are outlawed, dances are outlawed. What's accompanying with the dances is all of the musical practices as well. So drums, for example. Um, were essentially outlawed in this country until about the 1960s or so. Uh, where I lived in Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, Treaty 1 territory, homeland of the Métis, the community just north of there, the Broken Head Reserve, they didn't get their big drum back until really the late 1960s, early 1970s or so. Drums, if they were sounded in communities for a long period of time, would be confiscated by the RCMP, would be removed by the Indian agent, would be burned, uh, would be taken away. There's stories uh, all across the prairies of ceremonies that are still done to this day where um, instead of being able to use traditional rattles, uh, people were using uh, blue ribbon uh, baking soda tins on the end of a stick because you could get the tin still from the local store. You would fill that with your beads or with your, with your stones. That would be the rattle that you would use in your ceremony. Other stories that have been told to me by elders are there's, and these, you know, these, these ceremonies still are recreated today to remember and to never forget, wherein instead of being able to sound a drum and actually make the noise, which would draw the attention of the Indian agent or the RCMP officer and would result in all sorts of ugly oppressions, um, sometimes just a flat skin would be laid on the ground and, and the drumsticks would be beat on the, on the flat skin still to make that connection with the earth, still to make the connection with that heartbeat, but not making the noise that would draw the attention and then the harshness uh, and the punitive actions of, of the Canadian state. There was just a lot of just, um, uh, just sort of general disdain for Indigenous practices as well. So this particular chunk of text, you can see in the middle here, um, towards the bottom, they talk about the drums and the cedar trumpet. And the bottom line is particularly telling. They made more noise than music, and their chants were more monotonous than melodious. The true melody and compass of the voice was not exercised. So this was an account from William Collison. He was one of the first missionaries on the coast here. This is him writing about his experiences in Haida Gwaii as he's extending the arms, the long arms of the church into communities and becoming an active agent of suppression. Coming in with this idea that this, the music isn't good, it's not that developed, it's certainly not Western, and ultimately needs to kind of be left behind in the past and, and ultimately... Um, uh, eliminated. You also see this kind of just general gross um, paternalism uh, in records like this. And BTW, I'd like to thank Karina for her good work in helping me uh, pull out some of these quotes. Um, you can see in this one here, Alice Flesher, Indian Song and Story from North America, 1900. When thinking about in Indigenous music, these songs are like the wildflowers that have not yet come under the transforming hand of the gardener. The gardener, of course, being white people, the, of course, the, the gardener being Western European notions of music, very specific, and coming in with this general disregard for indigenous ways of knowing and being, indigenous practices, which, of course, is being buttressed by residential schools and a whole bunch of legislation and a whole bunch of forced displacement and removal. So as the, as the state starts to gain control over kids, you see that music still remains a part of actually residential school education and you see you know, bands being uh, developed and choirs happening. This one's kind of a, a photograph from the Maryville Residential School in Saskatchewan. It's kind of telling because this is a photo of a Christmas concert, but of course the only people that are listed on the back of the photo aren't the students, but the, 
the um, officials or the nuns that were listed in there. So the kids are always kind of silenced in this, and certainly their cultures are kind of silenced in a lot of the records, which is where we're having still such a difficulty trying to figure out you know, who some of the kids are that attended. This here is a photograph of the Metlakatla band, um, which was the, the pipe band or the, the brass band that was started at the Metlakatla um, boarding school. This was a very early boarding school that ran on the coast, was kind of heralded as being uh, uh, an example, uh, exemplar that other schools should be following as they were you know, teaching uh, kids and communities on again, how to pick up Western forms of music and Western forms of art, all at the cost of indigenous forms of art and music and music making. I'm sharing this because I want us to sort of generally understand the foundation um, that we're operating out of. And, and I'll, I'm going to play you a few songs now, and, and, and we're going to take a look at a period of time. And we're going to take a look at what's happening inside of residential schools, and we're going to take a look at what's happening outside of residential schools in or around 1967, which marked uh, the 100th anniversary, the 100th uh, birthday of, um, of Canada at that particular point. So this particular um, image that I've got up here, this is uh, a record, uh, a vinyl record, like an LP, of the Portage Indian Student Residence Glee Club. To be certain, to be certain, I, I don't want to uh, cast judgment on what this experience was like for the students in there because we certainly have heard from students that being part of this club was actually a very welcome escape from all the other stuff that was happening inside of these residential schools, right? That it was a way to actually kind of have a little bit of joy and have a little bit of um, fun, I guess, if you will, inside of what were really horrific institutions. And we see this uh, same thing with sports, uh, with other ways that you know, students were able to just be kids for a little while, be it through music or, or be it through, through things. So I'm not casting judge in, judgment on the students, but what I think we do want to look at critically is, is how, what songs are being sung and what these kids are being asked to do. And we're going to kind of compare and contrast this with, a, uh, with, a, um, with uh, another piece here. So, remembering that uh, this is students that are in a residential school against their will. Um, sorry, let me just slide this over here. There we go. Uh, this is all available online if you want to see it. So we can kind of pick any one of these songs. They're all fairly, um, fairly questionable. But let's just think about this one. In the context of kids who are removed from their parents, isolated, lonely, being subjected to extreme levels of physical and sexual violence inside of these schools, and then being trotted out to sing to audiences at Expo uh, 67. Oops. <laughs> Thank you. 
can play one more here. Um, so Land of the Silver Birch, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us kind of are familiar with that song. Um, it is a complete caricature of Indigenous culture and identity, and it is a uh, just a really a, a um, well, it's a complete caricature. Uh, so we got these kids singing it. Uh, they're talking about in the second verse of that song, you know, building my wigwam on the water. I mean, written by somebody, written by by um, somebody who really uh, didn't have. Um, much understanding at all about uh, Indigenous peoples whatsoever. Um, this one here is a bit of a medley that they came up with, and we um, have the refrain of, um, of course, the classic Canadian song, and this is uh, with big air quotes around it, um, uh, the one little, two little, three little Indians, which we'll hear uh, in this one. <laughs> So of course there's a lot going on in there. One, I mean, we're singing about 20 million Canadians, which is representing the whole goal, fundamental uh, aspect of colonization. We're talking about, um, again, this kind of uh, caricature, I suppose, of indigenous peoples that kids are being taught. Meanwhile, they're being taught that, they're, they're being given this opportunity inside of the residential schools uh, to sing these types of songs while simultaneously being taught that their own songs, their own songs that have been in these lands for millennia, have no rightful place in Canadian society. Um, and that those songs aren't even part of the uh, curriculum, can't even be included because of course parents are prevented from visiting their children in the schools, kids are prevented from returning home to their parents, and the teachers are just profoundly ignorant in regards to what the actual needs are of Indigenous peoples to be Indigenous. So this is 1967. Now, where we go next is, um, uh, and sorry, this is just, um, I'm still looking for my cursor here. Um, where we go next is, is to look at what else is said in this year. And I'll just pop up to the top here. Sorry, I should have done mirroring here. It should be this one here. So this is, this became quite, important, uh, an important sort of archival document um, on our recent 150th birthday as we revisited as a country the questions of colonization and confederation and the profound awkwardness of recognizing 150 years when we're in lands that have 10, 20, 200,000 years of, of human uh, existence. I'm gonna play this clip. Dan George is a chief from Greater Vancouver area, um, uh, Tsleil-Waututh Nation, uh, musician, actor, activist, leader within his community. Um, again, some of the language is, is a bit dated. I mean, this is from 1967, but what I think we will find is that when 
we're hearing what Dan George is saying, it's very different than what we're hearing from inside of the residential schools. And we're really beginning to see how Canada is kind of operating. And we're also seeing that Canada, by the late 1960s too, is starting to, starting to, not doing well yet, but starting to create more space for Indigenous peoples to say what needs to be said. So this is also reflecting a bit of a birth of our, uh, you know, some of the initial seminal work of the National Film Board of Canada, some of the really important Indigenous activism that was happening in this country was all more um, apparent in the late 1960s um, just by virtue of the overall rise of civil rights and, and, and just the, the tenor of, of conversation. I think as we listen to this, we can think about, you know, um, how much has changed and how much hasn't changed really um, since this uh, piece was created. How long have I known you, Canada? A hundred years? Yes, a hundred years. And many, many times more. And today, when you celebrate your hundred years of Canada, I am sad. For all the Indian people throughout the land. For I have known you when your forests were mine. When they gave me my meat and my clothing. I have known you in your brooks and your rivers, where your fish flashed and danced in the sun, and whose water said, Come and eat of my abundance. I have known you in the freedom of your winds, and my spirit, like your winds, once rose this good land. But in the long hundred years since the white man came, I've seen that freedom disappear, just like the salmon as they mysteriously go out to sea. The white man's strange customs I could not understand pressed down upon me until I could no longer breathe. When I fought to protect my home and my lands, I was called a savage. When I neither understood nor welcomed this new way of life, I was called lazy. When I tried to rule my people, I was stripped of my authority. My nation was ignored in your history textbook. We were less important in the history of Canada than the buffalo that ranged the plains. I was ridiculed in your plays and motion pictures, and when I drank the fire water, I got drunk, very, very drunk, and I forgot. Oh, Canada, how can I celebrate with you the centenary of this hundred years? Shall I thank you for the reserves that are left me of my beautiful forest? Shall I thank you for the canned fish of my rivers? Shall I thank you for the loss of my pride and authority, even among my own people? For the lack of my will to fight back? No, I must forget what is past and gone. Oh God in heaven, give me the courage of the old chief. Let me wrestle with my surroundings. Let me once again, as in the days of old, dominate my environment. Let me humbly accept this new culture and through it, rise up and go on. Oh God, like the thunderbird of old, I shall rise again out of the sea. I shall grasp the instruments of the white man's success, his education, his skills, 
But with these new tools, I shall build my race into the proudest segment of your society. And before I follow the great chiefs who have gone before us, I shall see these things come to pass. I shall see our young braves and our chiefs sitting in the house of law and government, ruling and being ruled by the knowledge and freedom of our great land. So shall we shatter the barriers of our isolation. So shall the next hundred years be the greatest in the proud history of our tribes and nations. So this was uh, oh. <laughs> this was something that was um, uh, read in the um, uh, well delivered both um, via CBC and then more broadly in a major public address at uh, a major gathering over in, in Vancouver as well. Um, I think it's pretty obvious that we're seeing two very different Canadas: uh, the Canada that is being enforced upon Indigenous peoples inside of the residential schools, and then this Canada that uh, Chief Dan George is talking about. Now, in regards to the, to the um, histories of um, around this particular time, we too are still doing this unfinished work of, of Dan George's lament, and we are still doing work uh, that has started a long, long time ago in this country, especially in regards to the recognition honoring and uh, recovery of children that never returned home from the schools. Again, as we go back into time, we see that in the 1960s, this was already actively being discussed by Indigenous peoples. And I'm just going to play you some of this clip. I'm not going to play you all of it just in the interest of time. But Willie Dunn is one of these early uh, Indigenous songwriters, activists, uh, coming out at the same time as well, a whole host of other singer-songwriters, but you know, at the same time as Buffy St. Marie, this kind of mid-1960s, where Indigenous peoples are using their voice, using music, using these opportunities to talk about issues that are of great, significant societal importance. And uh, just popping over here. And this one is going to be interesting because you, you may note that the title for this one, it's called Charlie Wenjack. And I'm just going to play you about two minutes of this clip or so, about a minute or so. We're going to see this name come back again later in the, in the presentation here. <laughs> Walk on, little Charlie, walk on through the snow Heading down the railway line, trying to make it home And he's made it 40 miles, 600 left to go It's a long, old, lonesome journey, shuffling through the snow He's a lonesome man, he's a hungry It's been a time since the last he's ate And as the night grows colder He wonders of his fate For his legs are racked with pain As he staggers through the night As he sees through his troubled eyes His hands are returned The 
slow fade out there, but uh, just very briefly, I mean, what this song is talking about is about the death of uh, Charlie Wenjack, or Channy Wenjack, as he's now known, um, who ran away from the Cecilia Jeffrey Residential School. Now, this was a big deal in, in the late 1960s and had been covered um, by uh, McLean's magazine. Um, so it is interesting, as even as we come to events like this, uh, with Chief Willie Sellers from Williams Lake just three weeks ago announcing the findings of 93 children that never returned home from the residential schools, that we still continue to be met with a de degree of shock in this country about this. Uh, frankly, Kamloops shouldn't have shocked us, but it has. And it reflects the fact that despite the presence of these stories and despite the long-standing advocacy by Indigenous peoples to raise awareness of the untimely death of students in the residential schools, the human rights violations, the lament generally for confederation, the intolerable uh, human rights record of, of Canada, that as a society we still um, have not really fully uh, heard uh, those messages yet. Um, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission released its final report, it took a hard look at what was happening inside of residential schools and found that because of just what we've seen just lightly here, or just have touched on in this, that the residential schools amounted to a system of cultural genocide. Genocide being an overall all-encompassing effort of a state to eliminate or eradicate. Uh, cultural genocide, is the effort to destroy a culture or cultures in this context in their entirety. Therefore, the path moving out of this has to be the restoration and the reestablishment and the support for uh, the resurgence of Indigenous cultures because Canada itself um, is, is directly complicit in the, um, in the destruction of them. Uh, this has been supported, of course, by a number of um, further reports, including the report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, and has been further buttressed by major uh, associations in Canada, such as the Canadian Historical Association, that have looked deeply into the question of whether or not it is a history of genocide. And it is. So that is the, the complexity that we have to understand about this nation, and we have to recognize that how music itself, how arts itself have been seen in society um, is and has both been an aspect of the tools of genocide, so the, the, the uh, method of inflicting harm by, you know, uh, displacing indigenous uh, uh, ways of knowing and being, and it also represents a pathway out of this as well. So the reestablishment, the reconstitution, uh, the support for Indigenous arts and cultures is, is of vital importance. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission itself really was and has been one of the most significant efforts in Canadian history to help Canadians take a hard look at this very complex history. And I'm going to show you a bit of a journey now of what this has looked like musically um, recently. So the first clip that I'm going to show you is a, um, a song that is written by a, an intergenerational residential school survivor by the name of Murray Porter. He's also from the greater Vancouver area, um, uh, is living there now at least. Uh, and this is a bit of a mashup, this particular clip that I'm going to show you. So the, the song itself is entitled, um, uh, Is Sorry Enough? And it's questioning the apology made by the Prime Minister. So is it enough to say sorry, or do we need to dig deeper than that? The footage here is, is a bit of a mashup from the Williams Lake uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearing. And the lady that you're seeing right on the screen here right now is Phyllis Webstad. For those of us that happen to have orange shirts, um, this was the event at which the orange shirt movement really was born. It was at the Williams Lake hearing. So, her testimony, this is the genesis, really, of this entire Orange Shirt Day movement, which is now spread from coast to coast to coast and is a really powerful 
uh, means of mobilizing support and uh, citizen engagement with this uh, work of reconciliation. Again, I might not play the whole song here just in the interest of time. Oops, I love boating, yes, thank you. Um, but, uh, You say you're sorry, it's not what you say, it's what you do. You tell us you'll do better, but it's hard to believe in you. Now the day has finally come You told the world That you were wrong But far too many Have passed on now When it's sorry Took away our children, stole our mother's love, laid waste to our traditions, wasn't there. Separated from my culture So many years So alone With no mothers so You can see really what's happening here is, is Murray himself as a as a indigenous man a First Nations man asking uh, the very important question uh, about is this going to carry us the distance now? Is, are these apologies actually going to help us make the substantive changes necessary in society to ensure that we are not, again, lamenting uh, Confederation 200 years from now, 150 years from now? A big part of the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission then was actually the, the effort to help Canadians um, understand that they actually have some very significant responsibilities, uh, that this is not an Indigenous problem that we're talking about. This is actually very fundamentally a Canadian problem. Um, the idea of listening, of respecting, of honouring uh, residential school survivors' experiences uh, is something that you're going to hear in this next clip. Uh, this is one of my own tracks, um, but uh, and as, a, uh, as yet unreleased. But what this is, uh, an effort um, of mine at least to do, was to recount the words of residential school survivors and the Truth and Reconciliation Commissioners in a way that matches it with music and tries to get at this, this calling to or quest for regular everyday Canadians accepting their responsibilities to, to do the hard work that's necessary. So the, the chorus of this song are the commissioners, the, the verses are survivors. Um, this comes out of a series of hearings that we held uh, through the northern reaches of Canada. A uh, bit of a trigger warning on this one because um, the, the um, stories that you hear from survivors are a bit um, harder, um, but uh, that's kind of the, the truth-telling work that um, we're also all a part of here. So I'm gonna play this here for you now. Genocide, 
everything changed. There was a plane that landed by the shore. That landed by the shore. And the government were picking up kids. I looked back at my parents. I said, I don't want to go. I started crying, but I was grabbed by my arm and forced into the plane. When they closed the door, I was looking out the window. I could see my parents together. But there is no way I could get back out. It's important to us to hear about your unique experience, but it's also extremely important to Canada. It's about listening, learning, educating, preserving, and honoring. Responsibility. So that they take so a responsibility. Under the time for everybody to go home for the summer months, I would ask the nuns, "Can I go home too?" I would just want to get slapped. No, you're not going. Do I go go cry in a corner? I stayed in that damn place without leaving the yard. Punishment became a norm for me. Scrubbing stairs with a toothbrush, being denied food, kneeling in the snow late into the night, while the nuns sit there in a blanket. We're in our pajamas, in a bitter cold, being hit by a hand, strap or a wooden ruler. I have a scar on my head from that wooden ruler. I have perforated eardrums from the many hits of a hand to my ears. I have a burn on my arm because I wouldn't iron the way that nun had told me to iron. With a hot iron, she burned me. It's important to us to hear about your unique experience, but it's also extremely important to Canada. It's about listening, learning, Educating, preserving, and honoring. To tell Canada what it is that has been done. About the truth of what it is that they have done. So that they take responsibility. In the period from Confederation until the decision to close residential schools was taken... Canada clearly participated in a period of cultural genocide. Cultural genocide. Cultural genocide. Cultural genocide. It's about listening, learning, educating, preserving, and honoring. So that they take responsibility. Responsibility. It's about listening. Responsibility. Listening. Responsibility. Listening. Responsibility. Listening. Responsibility. Listening. Responsibility. 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 interesting is that we're starting to get to a point where Canadians are starting to accept 
some of their responsibilities. Um, I know I just got to watch time here a little bit, but I want to give you a couple of examples of some Canadian bands that have actually dug into this. So this is a Canadian band called Winter Sleep. A great band, love Winter Sleep, um, uh, uh, East Coast band. Um, and what I'm going to do here is, well, we can see this. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll just play this slide again here. You can see them grappling with this sense of responsibility that comes along with being a Canadian once you understand this truth. And the question very much as to what we're talking about in, uh, or what we heard in Abdullah's good presentation is, what are the responsibilities of artists to engage in this work? What are, what are the responsibilities as Canadian artists to be engaged in these conversations of colonization, of, of, uh, of genocide even? This here, I'll just play a bit of the clip, is um, Winter Sleep's uh, response to this. And uh, I'll just play a few minutes um, of this just very quickly. But you can hear right off the hop what the lyrics are uh, getting into. And you can see the title itself is called Beneficiary. All my days I wake up up in my eyes A beneficiary of a genocide Drive to work all day, go to sleep at night A beneficiary of a genocide song and I don't know this may be one of the few Canadian songs with genocide in the chorus actually so it it is interesting and it does reflect this kind of space that we're in today uh, in regards to engagement of, of mainstream Canadian artists as we're starting to become much more aware of these truths that are increasingly uh, undeniable um, oops Double clicker thing is I'm all confused here. There we go. Okay, escape. The other one, of course, that was very, very famous, and I'm, again, I'm going to play the tail end of it, um, was Gord Downey's work on The Secret Path. <laughs> now, remember, 2016 is about 50 years after. Willie Dunn had already written the song on Charlie Winjack as well. So this is the exact same story, motivated by the exact same article that came out of McLean's. But for Gord Downey, at this point in his particular, in his life, what he recognized he had to do was do something. And I mean, there's a long story, lots of stories that I can tell obviously with all of this, but you know, one of the conversations that I had with Gord was just around that particular thing. You, you have a voice, you have a platform, you should do something. And that was something that the TRC had really hoped for is that we would see Canadians generally take up the cause of reconciliation and engage with it in their art, on their stages as being, um, really important uh, political figures in many ways to mobilize change and to raise awareness. And I think one of the things that The Secret Path absolutely did was introduce this story of residential schools to a lot of Canadians that had maybe heard of it on the periphery, but hadn't really engaged deeply with it. And we picked up that whole kind of group of Tragically Hip fans 
by virtue of this. And it was a bit strange at some point uh, along the journey. Uh, I was at all of the shows that um, th this only really played three times live, um, Ottawa, Toronto, and Halifax. And the Toronto show in particular was kind of, it had this odd tension between being a rock concert where people were like, you know, drinking beer and ready to party to the tragically hip and the families being present and a lot of Indigenous peoples looking to engage in what was a very s deep and very, very emotional experience. Um, if you haven't seen The Secret Path, I would recommend watching it. If you watch it on CBC Arts, there's a very good panel uh, conversation afterwards featuring yours truly. Um, but it, um, it is an important engagement and represents, you know, a major historical figure in Canada engaging and picking up this work and that sense of responsibility around. I am a stranger. I am a stranger. I'm going to play two more clips here. I'm just going to roll straight The following is a CBC special presentation. Um, again, opportunities for a relationship, and I'm not going to play the actual music, I'm just going to play the dialogue between these two really super talented Canadian artists. Don Amaro, great Indigenous artist. Again, we can talk at length about him, but I, I just want to just play the first clip in terms of what they're talking about in terms of responsibilities and social activism. Thank you very much, everybody. Sorry. Yeah. Give me my clicker again here. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. genuinely happy being a solo artist, but I'll tell you, if I was ever to form a duo, I would do it with this guy, our special guest that's been on this run of dates here across the great province of Manitoba, an outstanding songwriter, uh, a great performer, and an even better guy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, my good buddy, Mr. Don Amaro! Ladies and gentlemen, Kiss Marrow. Yeah. Hey! Kiss Marrow. You know what? That would just make a great t-shirt. You know, Gene Simmons might have a problem with that, but I'll tell you. Um, I've been so thankful that I've got the opportunity to perform with you for the last few nights, Don. And uh, what we did is a few years ago, ladies and gentlemen, we wrote a song together and we collaborated on a, 
I think a very important topic, something that's obviously very popular right now in Canada, and rightfully so. Um, we don't think that we are the guys necessarily to lead the charge when it comes to making up for the wrongdoings in the past and leading reconciliation by any sense, but we thought that if there's anything that we know, is that music has the ability to heal people. And uh, I thought, you know, Don, maybe you could talk about how you came up with the idea for this song, because I'm so proud that we get to play here tonight. For sure, so uh, this song's called Rebuild This Town. And I was on the flight to go hang with Brent, and we were doing some writing for a, for a show we were part of. And, uh, and you know, Brent and I, like he said, we're not, we're not necessarily the answer, but we know that uh, music can, can move people in a big way. And we thought, you know, we can be on the front lines of that conversation and maybe say, you know, we're not, we're not the answer, but maybe we can be part of uh, the change that's going to happen in this country that's already happening. And I think a song like this kind of speaks to that. And I hope you like it. last uh, couple of slides have, have hopefully kind of drawn out is this idea of helping one another, working together, this idea of partnership. So much about what we had hoped for as a Truth and Reconciliation Commission was opportunities like this, where individual Canadians would accept their responsibilities, when artists would understand that they have a responsibility to do something, where we would see collaborations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples coming together to unite for a common purpose and a common cause. I'm going to leave us off with one song, um, and I know I've taken a little bit extra time here, um, my apologies, but uh, the, the final song that I'm going to leave us with is this one here. And again, I'm, I'm, there's so much that we haven't covered yet, um, but I'm going to leave us with this one here. And this song, I think, is so powerful for so many reasons, um, and I love this image uh, for for a bunch of different reasons. This is a song by Elizabeth Isaac, uh, an uh, Inuit singer, an Inuk herself. I don't know if you can see in her eye, but her eye is looking at old archival footage of her people um, from a long time ago. This is a cover song of a Willie Thrasher song. Um, Willie Thrasher was an early Inuk artist, um, really never was given the credit he was due as an artist and is one of these, like a, a really important contributor to folk music, indigenous folk music in this country. What I think is so critically important about this in regards to music though, is how this video captures two sentiments. Um, one, the chorus of wolves don't live by the rules, right? The idea that indigenous peoples have fundamental human rights and fundamental rights that are inherent. Um, that need not be sanctioned by the state, but are, are just part of being indigenous. And it's actually the state itself that has to reconcile itself with the idea that wolves don't live by the rules, right? The idea that, you know, um, whales transmit our borders freely, right? That we can't put people into conceptual or political boxes that are fundamental suppressions or eliminations or attacks of their inherent human rights. Uh, secondly, I think this, this video reflects the hard work that so many Indigenous people are doing today to, to reclaim and recapture in the aftermath of all of this genocide, in the aftermath of all of this hurt that has been inflicted. 
And it's why I'm such a, a huge fan of this song. I just, I really do love it. And I, I will leave us off here um, with this one as we listen to uh, Alyssa P. Um, tell us and remind us that wolves need not and should not live by the rules. And that's actually something really important for us to embrace as a society. So here we go. for spending some time with us here I will just is Hello Fresh worth the price? Uh, absolutely in the beginning I was doubtful too uh, until I realised I was actually saving money by cooking with Hello Fresh for example this week I ordered a fillet steak and fries jerk spice chicken there we go sorry about that um, yeah it's just oh, a little no, I, no. I get I get a commission he a knows the high dog yeah but um, yeah I'll just pop this back up and um, yeah thank you for taking the time um, to listen to me. And uh, yeah, I think uh, Alaspe, uh, Alaspe said it all, so yeah. Thanks. Okay, so I think we will move on to the, uh, we're good, Marco? Yeah, we'll move on to the questions. Um, uh, as our, <laughs> so, uh, Rai, you had mentioned, just as we were, uh, um, at the end of Abdullah's, um, that you were, you, you kind of wanted to return to this idea of individual accountability versus collective accountability. Could you maybe speak speak to what you were getting at there and um, and, and how in particular, and then Abdullah, I'd love to hear your response to this sort of concept as well. Yeah, um, that idea, I think I have to give one of our colleagues on campus uh, here from political science department credit for helping me think through this one, and that's Matt James out of political science. Matt wrote a paper a little while ago looking at how individuals appear in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report, and 
found that we tended to, it, well, the report tends to emphasize individual actors' responsibilities or failed responsibilities um, over the course of time. Because when you look at the long history that we've got in Canada, we've had so many opportunities to do better and make better changes and make better choices. And for whatever reason, political leaders uh, have not exercised the power that they have to do better and to make the hard changes. So there's all these squandered opportunities. And I think even as I've been, as I thought through the, the songs that we played, I mean, we're, we're not talking about presidents or we're not really talking about Justin Trudeau or we're not, yeah. we're not pointing a finger at, hey, man, like, what are you doing? And I really saw that in, in your yeah. examples that it was very much in more individualized and mm -hmm. pointing at individual actors. Yeah. So this seems much more collective, which is kind of maybe a little bit more comfortable, but I think doesn't have, it might not put as much agency into the system to understand that there are people with significant amounts of power that could be exercising that power in a much more effective manner to promote or protect human rights. Okay. I'm delighted to that, to that question. I mean, it is a singular president <laughs> that's, that's behaving on behalf of a government. Um, where does this, where does this uh, sort of finger, not finger pointing, but you know, it's, it's circling around an individual, where, where, does this, um, where does this meet in, your, in, your, in, your, uh, in, in Senegal? I mean, it's not only about the president but the president has this kind of prominent position, you know, that gives him more responsibility than the other ones. Mm -hmm. If you remember a, a little bit, uh, when I was showing this video clip uh, about um, uh, Yanamar, Kirby Crew, they were pointing out also the fact that you have a kind of whole team, you know, just destroying this country you have the president, you have his ministers, you have these fake opponents who are joining you know, the majority. So it's a kind of whole group that is point, pointed by, by, by these uh, accusations. But there is also uh, another level of responsibility that maybe does not appear as clear as I, I want it. It is also the fact that the society is responsible of this situation. Mm. This is also a, another, another fact, important fact. At like, okay, we are living this situation, but we have the power to change it. So use this power just to bring another kind of situation for our country. So the responsibility here is not at the same levels for all kind of actors, social actors, mm -hmm. but it, it is at the same time individual and collective. Mm -hmm. And in some songs, I mean, it's not as much about the president. It is like, you gotta do something. And when I was sometimes um, talking with uh, leaders from Yanamar, sometimes they were like, okay, it's just like sometimes people are trying to escape their accountability people as citizens, and who are waiting for us like to take the lead. But our job is not still to take the lead. Our job is to away people of what we are supposed to do as every single citizen. So we can bear the struggle, but it is a struggle of every single person. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I make, it makes sense with yeah. what you said, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So different levels of responsibility and accountability um, but it is, at the same time, individual and collective, yeah. as Rai said, yeah. Mm -hmm. And responsibility seems to be the, the very common bridge here. Like, you know, that's, it's that certain positions have more responsibilities, therefore they, the expectation is that they exercise that responsibility better. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe one more thing, one more thing. Uh, I, I talked a lot about prison, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, just to mention that when these uh, musicians are put in prison, usually people are organizing, I mean, it's not necessarily people 
of the movement, but people are organizing demonstration to ask for, you know, for their freedom. So I think that there is something going on actually, really. So mm. Not bad, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Um, this balance, and, and this would be one that works across from Canadian artists to Senegalese artists, but this balance between, um, you know, this being their profession uh, and, and trying to reach some kind of, um, well, to be, have a viable life, uh, and, but also to um, do good work and, and, and promote um, either, you know, the political positions that they have or some of the, um, you know, aspects that we have here in Canada. How, where, where does, how do the artists that you've worked with, how do they balance that? And then, Ryan, maybe to you as well, how, how do you see that working within our certain society and the, you know, the commercial pressures that exist um, for an artist? Hmm. Very good question. <laughs> yes, I mean, um, it is a kind of uh, quite, um, um, not easy to handle uh, for the artists because they have to, to make a living from, from what they are doing as professionals, yes. And at the same time, they're trying to, to use music, as I said the last day, as a kind of weapon for bringing the social change that is so badly needed, okay? And so, of course, it's just sometimes uh, by trying to, to get this contract, the government may have the possibility, you know, to create difficulties and obstacles for them. I, I was talking one day with uh, Simon, who, who was telling me that, and it's not only Simon, I mean, I, I had this kind of conversation with uh, so many artists who are very involved in this, um, this activism. They were telling me that sometimes they, they have this kind of very nice offer, very interesting, really. But once <laughs> people just realized that they had one song or two against the president or against the minister, they just, you know, held him back. Mm -hmm. Because they don't want to have problems with the power, with the majority. And it happens very frequently. So, yeah, it, is, it does have a consequence to be an uh, artist engaged <laughs> in this kind of situation. And there is another aspect. I, I mean, uh, when you also um, like an artist engaged, uh, even vis-a-vis -vis your audience, it's like, because one of the things that also can make the music attractive is this kind of entertainment dimension, which is not still very present sometimes in this kind of music devoted before everything to political aspects. So how you, do you balance all these things? It is a kind of a permanent negotiation between you and yourself, because you, as someone who has responsibility to feed your family, okay, to make a living, and you, as this very same individual who thinks that you are also accountable of bringing these very, very needed changes. So it's not easy for, for them. And that's really what I have understood by you know, speaking with them. It's very difficult. But I think that they are, they are really trying to, to do not lose one aspect, and especially this kind of political aspect. Mm. So yeah, not, not easy. Yeah, and I suppose here, I mean, it's this, you know, I have to be very careful with generalizations, but I would say, using a generalization, it's a fairly consistent Indigenous teaching um, writ large that, you know, you don't operate just as an individual in isolation. You're, you're collectively responsible and you're, you're, you're in service of the people writ large. Um, so you're 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 accountable to your community and you're in service of your community, and that's really, I think, consistent with what leadership means. Um, you're working essentially for the people. And I think most, if not all, artists that I've come across um, carry that pretty pretty core within their practice. So it's it's you know 
even if you're just writing like a love song, um, you're still thinking about what that what that means for the people and how that might improve relationships between individuals or you know parents and children or something like that. I think it's you know you're never really divorced from some of these just fundamental foundational responsibilities that are kind of deeply ingrained with just walking a particular path in life and and being an indigenous person in Canada. So so you know whether or not it's it's as overt as a as an overt political statement even if it's not an overt political statement, there's still that responsibility, I'd say, that's coming through the art somehow or another, generally, again, with big air quotes around the generally and all the caveats and asterisks yeah. and everything. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, maybe just one, one more thing. I mean, like, the government have, uh, uh, I mean, really room to, to create difficulties for artists. Uh, I mean, just like when they can oblige you to pay your taxes because you're using some imported instruments for your home studio or stuff like that. And they can do it very easily, okay? Um, there is one of the artists, I don't remember exactly who, maybe it was, it is uh, Awadi or, uh, or, or Smokey. There, there is one clip where he's, he was like, uh, there is a jig this is organized, and the president uh, is just like taking out the list, the truck list. And when he saw one name, he was like, uh, "Why is this guy is here?" And the guy, the guy, well, no, he's a very good musician, and so I don't want him to be in this list. <laughs> and the intro of the song is 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 about that. So. Finally, they removed the list, and then the artists appear and started to, you know, to perform. Mm. But yes, yeah, the message was like this: Okay, what I'm doing finally is uh, very difficult for me. It is a way for his for his artists to show that, okay, he get exposed by trying to to represent his people. Mm. And yeah, it it may happen. It may happen really that you are you are removed from from gigs. And it's not necessarily something that will appear to be straight because they, you have this kind of um, indirect influence. They can pass by people, by people to reach you. Mm. Uh, yeah, and yeah, that's really hard sometimes for them. And when it happens so hard, to be so hard also, one of the problems is your, 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 your family. Uh, who are pushing back because it's like, yeah, uh, you don't want something for you, uh, you don't have enough ambition, and so and so. So the, this kind of pressure is even more difficult than the, the one from the government. And it can sometimes, uh, you know, just push you to, to let it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank mm. you. I just have one last question and then we'll turn it over to the room. Um, Right, you, you spoke about, um, you know, Indigenous artists feeling or knowing that, that um, you know, a sense of the collective and being responsible to that, to that community. Um, and then we have um, Abdullah's artist engagé. I love this, I uh, love mm. this term. Um, and so maybe to flip it a little bit and not focus on the artist, but focus on the listener and the, the larger listening body in Canada, um, how do we, how can that be engaged? So that they understand some of that knowing, some of those ways of being mm. um, that are, are embedded into the music. How can we, how can we better that? Uh, I guess understanding and engage the listener. Yeah, I think that's a super good question, Kirk. Um, because I think you know, as I was, I was reflecting a little bit more on the question of like, you know, the the capitalism or the the making money off your music. I think part of the problem is is that. You know, there's still not a, you know, it's still an uphill battle to make money as an Indigenous artist from music. I mean, it's hard enough as it is, but, you know, we don't have a lot of, we don't have a lot of big breakthrough artists. Um, um, as of yet, there's certainly a number through history, and obviously we've talked about Buffy St. Marie already, and people like Robbie Robertson, um, Tribe Called uh, Red, Tanya Tagak, Jeremy Dutcher. Um, and then, you know, there's the Crystal Shawandas and, and others, uh, Shane Yellowbird. Um, 
but um, I think as with most things indigenous in this country is, is people just, you know, a lot of Canadians just get pretty complacent with indigenous peoples and histories. So there's just a lot of page turning that generally happens or just non-engagement or not looking for it. Um, it is harder to ignore now. Uh, the, the, you know, the big organizations like the NFB and, and even major film companies are, are buying more Indigenous content now. There is more Indigenous content on TV. Um, but in general, uh, a, a general standing rule for, for most reconciliation acts is to, for Canadians to lean deeper into what Indigenous peoples are saying, uh, forms of cultural expression, and then to understand the richness that is there. So, for example, I mean, every week there's a, you know, top 40 Indigenous music countdown. You know, it's Googleable. Um, there's been Indigenous music awards that have been running forever, it seems like, and some really incredible uh, musicians. Um, we haven't even talked about, like, other genres. Like, we're, we're mostly talking about sort of contemporary music, but there's the, all of the richness around... Uh, you know, powwow drumming and, and you know, those, those styles of, of expression that are complex, are nuanced, are, are very, very rich. Uh, you know, there's interrelationships with dance and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, be it authors, be it musicians, be it playwrights, be it poets, be it uh, filmmakers, be it thinkers, be it anything, each and every one of these represents an opportunity to just lean more into the community and, and see what people are saying and, and to really pay attention to it on, in an intentional manner. Because a lot of what's there, again, when we think about these collective responsibilities, a lot of what's there is, is fundamentally, I would call it good medicine, you know, positive human rights affirming efforts to tackle with some of the more complex manifestations of racism and other forms of oppression in society. So this is kind of, as we lean into this, this is all good, posit positive, um, you know, work for humanity in, in so many different ways. And, and there's lots of good thinking that's coming out of this that is in the collective interest. So I think it's just a matter of paying attention. It's right all around us, really. Mm -hmm. And then leaning into it and buying it too, and supporting the economy as well. Um, so supporting where possible, supporting artists, um, being intentional with consuming, um, uh, how we're consuming. So, right. so I know uh, Abdullah is keen, as you mentioned before. He's keen to hear from you as well. So uh, do we have any questions from, from the group here? Yes. For either Rai or Abdullah. Yes, go ahead. Peter. Yeah. For our online Either listeners, place. just to paraphrase very, very quickly so that they can hear this as well. A uh, question about the music industry and its role uh, in this sort of activity uh, and, and how they have either facilitated or blocked this kind of uh, um, social change or artist for change. Well, that's the economic aspect. Or yeah. Yeah? yeah, I think that's right. Is that, is that accurate, yeah. Peter? Okay. Is it about the economy, uh, the ecosystem? Of. Yeah, like um, maybe are some of the artists that you played today, are they all on the same record label? Oh, okay. And, um, yes, okay. <laughs> yes, there is a kind of very few ones who got these record deals, and most of them are, are, don't have really this possibility. Uh, quite recently, when I say recently, maybe it was like this last years. You have like Def Jam now in Africa, in West Africa, and Sony 
music. Uh, yeah, and they, but there are really a few ones that got this kind of deal. Like Munaya, I didn't have time to, to show a, a clip from her, but she, she's very interesting. Um, yeah, but for most of them, they are using a lot uh, the digital social networks to get uh, more visible, and this visibility is used to try to get uh, deals uh, about performances. So when you are having a lot of followers, it allows you to, to negotiate in a better uh, conditions uh, these kind of gigs. That's, that's what, what they are doing for, for, for most of them. But for the record this, really, it is something quite uncommon. And the other possibility is to, to produce yourself by raising this kind of very little money day by day. And just like recording when you, you reach uh, an amount and now going back to your job, <laughs> trying to get money. So most of them have a kind of um, other jobs to support their artistic you know, engagement. And I think that this is very evocative uh, about really the fact that they are very, very engaged in what they are doing because they are not really getting a lot of money and this little money they are getting is quite frequently reinvested <laughs> in their music. So yeah, uh, not this kind of big deals that you can have here. You have just some exceptions, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, as far as the industry goes, I mean, I'm, I've kind of lost a little bit of track of what's exactly going on now, so I'm gonna speak just only partially uh, knowledgeably on this, but uh, I mean, I think it's generally the same kind of thing. Um, there's a handful of artists that have got bigger deals, you know, proper representation, all that sort of stuff, um, and then most uh, that don't in terms of, um, of major impact. Uh, investing by labels in this, uh, you know, and and I think, you know, what's happening broadly within the festival ecosystem and stuff. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would characterize it so much as there's a lot of money for indigenous art in this country. I still don't think there is. Uh, the country is doing better at responding to its history and complicit the in the destruction of indigenous art forms though so it's living into its responsibilities part of the trc's um calls to action were for more balanced or equitable funding uh through the canada council for example and the canada council was called upon to ensure that it was um you know investing in indigenous arts one of the things that was talked about you know broadly through the trc and and continues to this day is that canada needs to be investing in the in the rebuilding of indigenous cultures to the same extent or more than it spent and invested in the destruction of them. So if you start thinking about how much it costs to build those 140 sites of human rights violation and how much it costs to run those things and how much it's cost to administer all of this sort of stuff, I mean, these have been, like, oppression is expensive. Um, and uh, we need to move out of that and into um, a much more supportive environment. That's where there's been calls to action for CBC to ensure that there's, for example, indigenous language programming on CBC um, and increased funding for the Aboriginal People's Television Network um, as, as a recognized sort of um, third national broadcaster in, in the country. Um, I think festivals themselves, as with all organizations, have a general responsibility to understand whose territory they're in, too, and to properly compensate people who, um, you know, are, are the rightful, you know, landowners or title holders of, of the territories. So including Indigenous peoples into a festival in Canada is, is not really an act of benevolence, but just kind of like a plainly obvious thing that we should have been doing all along. Uh, it's, it's, it's weird to think about not including the original inhabitants of the land in, you know, cultural activities um, when they're happening in territories. And of course that's been happening for a long time. So I think a lot about what has, what has been happening in the industry and what is important is just ensuring that Indigenous peoples have a place um, and are seen as being part of, 
part of the fabric of Canada because Canada, you know, one thing we didn't talk about this, but as Canada really began to build its own identity, um, and it's done this in many, many ways, shapes, and forms, but certainly in the 1920s, 1930s, and as arts policies started developing in the country, there was a very particular uh, notion of what art was and what it wasn't. And, and you know, so we saw symphonies and ballets and all that kind of stuff, and centers like the Banff Center for the Arts created, but we didn't see similar investments in indigenous cultures because that was incommensurate with uh, a, a robust Canadian identity, which a Canadian identity was largely modeled after Western European identities, of course. So, so I don't know if that really answers your question, but it sort of maybe touches on it a, a bit. <laughs> yeah. I know we have we have another question in the in the front row here. <clears throat> Okay. Beyond being engaged in their music, yeah, what they are doing. <laughs> very, very good, uh, you know, question. And yeah, um, I mean, uh, let's just give me one example, <laughs> okay. Um, during the 1990s, we had this kind of very big conflict between two major trends in hip-hop music in Senegal. The one was all about being underground, being hardcore, denouncing everything. The other one was like, oh, we are just doing music, okay? And we have the rights to <laughs> create love songs and sing and sing. So in 1998, one uh, rap crew, Rapa Joe, has released um, a finally what was a kind of seminal album in, a, in the history of uh, rap music in Senegal. It was uh, Hibaru Underground, the message from the underground. And Hibaru Underground was a single that was addressing the fact that people as musicians, uh, as hip hop musicians, should not be allowed to talk about love, to talk about this or that, because we have so many problems that it is a kind of emergency, okay, to address these very particular topics. And it went really ugly at the moment. And when the other, the other trend was like performing, uh, the audience were booing. Yeah, really. And we have seen at that moment uh, some hip hop artists who were quite well known as uh, 
what they call hip hop love in this genre, who started to change their style in order to be accepted. Yes, but actually, when you are taking this recent, recent period, it is like more opened, much more. And even those who are doing like uh, featurings with uh, other genres, like Mbalak, which is a kind of semi-traditional, semi-modern music in Senegal, but very, very popular, even those who are doing it were considered as a kind of traitors. But now, not only it is very common to have this collaboration between hip hop and other genres, but it is very recommended while doing hip hop uh, to get more rooted in this kind of you know, local and traditional influences mm. and to be more open about you know, uh, what you're doing. But still, it's like um, when you are seen as a rapper who is artist engagé, you have like more street credibility. You, you are more respected. But the trend actually is that we have so many young rappers who are very talented, but who are not addressing a lot this kind of political topics, but who have really a kind of big range of followers. The last thing, even for these rappers, and I have in mind one example, like Deep, he's one of the most famous actually in Senegal, talking about money and stuff and stuff, so uh, doing a lot of eco trips. During the, the past March, we, we had a kind of um, events uh, in Senegal because one political opponent, opponent was um, you know, arrested and accused of uh, like uh, sexual stuff. And everybody knows that it wasn't real, okay? So we have this kind of very big demonstrations all around the country. Everybody, everyone, almost. And unfortunately, um, more than 10 people get killed during these demonstrations by the police, okay? So Deep, who is not really known as an artist engagé, he's not in, on that. Uh, did a song, uh, very, very, like, <laughs> it was really a song against the, the president and the, the majority. Mm. But he never did before. What I, what I mean here is, okay, even though you have this kind of more openness and, you know, more, uh, the more you have the right now to, to, to do different things, but people uh, are still linked uh, uh, somewhat rap music to civil like engagement, rap music to, you know what I'm saying, uh, to this kind of political, you know, uh, stance. So still, yeah. <laughs> and just very quickly on that, I think the only thing I would say is, is that um, because of the, the concerted attacks on indigenous culture and identity here in this country, I think the inverse of that is you know, and this, I've heard this from lots of different elders, is speaking your language, singing your songs, knowing who you are, uh, um, knowing your history. These are all not just acts of self-determination, but they're inherently political acts because they're kind of saying, every time you sing your song, it's a form of resistance against erasure or erosion and is a fight back against all of that, which um, all of that energy of the state, which of, tried to eliminate these these um, these songs and identities from the uh, from the land so I, I think in that regard um, music has a s it it's it's always political in a way because it's been made political like just basically being indigenous in this country was made political by virtue of the decisions of the state a long, long time ago, and it will remain political until Indigenous peoples can be fully assured of the fact that, uh, you know, rights to be Indigenous are fully protected and upheld and not at risk or at threat, um, you know, on an ongoing basis. Um, usually, we are, I mean, 
sorry to jump in. <laughs> Usually we, we have this kind of very classical um, opposition between uh, hip-hop music in Senegal and other genres like uh, Mbalak. So Mbalak is very popular, as I said previously. But Mbalak is seen uh, as a kind of music uh, which is not very useful uh, except entertaining people, you see what I'm saying? So usually you just have this kind of dichotomy between Malah and rap, which, not, which is not still true, of course, but in the imaginary of people, it's more like Malah is uh, when you are celebrating something, mostly, and hip-hop is for more serious things. Uh, of course, um, yeah, uh, this is more complex than that, mm -hmm. but yeah, it is a kind of very, I mean, this is a kind of image that uh, people are linking to hip hop as a kind of yeah, music that is mostly interested by addressing political stuff. Yeah. Alexis, a question. Smokey, yeah. yeah. Um, there was almost like a parody, like French music from France, sort of parody oh, sound okay. to me, and it's in my ears. Anyways, and I'm wondering whether this is usual for, for Senegalese hip hop to be hearing, uh, or if you're even having a visual, visual comical effect. And as a listener, um, a, as a community of listeners, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that it makes sense. Yeah, okay. yeah uh, I'm going to go give, give you one example. Uh, it is, uh, I, I, I wrote an article on, on, on that. It, uh, yeah, it is uh, Fumalad. Fumalad is, um, is this kind of artist who is like very popular in Senegal, okay? And he's also in this uh, category of artist engagé. He's a member of Yanamar, not a founding member, but one of the first to integrate the movement after the, after the, the, the founding uh, members. I mean, it was maybe the same day in the night or the, the day after, I, I don't remember, but I, 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 I remember talking with uh, one of the founding members uh, who told me that uh, Fu Malad was what, really one of the first artists to join them, okay? So, but, Fumalad is also known as someone who is using a, a lot this kind of uh, irony to address very serious things. And it is working very well. <laughs> uh, in, in the perspective of the audience, um, it's like um, this kind of performances uh, is a, in, in a way allows the artist to, to reduce uh, the, the dramatical charge in the seriousness of what he's, uh, he's addressing. You, you see what I'm saying? And it allows this to like to be, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's really a kind of, uh, strategy, you know, uh, to do not address things uh, in a straight way and to make people, okay, laugh, but while laughing, also reflecting on, on this kind of topic. And he, he is doing it. And Smokey is this kind also of, of artist. Smokey is using a lot of irony address uh, very political, you know, aspects. And he's well known for, for that. I mean, you have like different styles 
And the audience uh, also is not like um, uniform, uniformized. So I think that we have also to take into account this, this aspect. So some people, you can reach them by being very straight. Some people, when you are very straight, you are just uh, shocking them, okay? And now, uh, from that point, they can reject a anything, and so, and so, and so. so. I don't know if I have <laughs> replied to you. No, that's great. That's okay. Great. You're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, it was interesting actually, because um, I uh, I was back in the archives just in in prepping for this talk a little bit, and um, and uh, some of the photographs that I put into this presentation were from the archives at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, which is the archive on residential schools in the country. Um, so there is stuff there. So you just go to nctr.ca. Uh, and there's a little button that says visit the archives and you can search around through there. Um, you know, some of the other research that we were doing just in prepping for this talk too, we're, we're trying to pull out these, these bits and this is where Karina was helping me on it and thank you again. Um, uh, you know, trying to find, refine some of these documents that I've seen that really were the expressed uh, prohibitions on music uh, by the state and and um, there are some records that are out there, and, and uh, I mean, there's a lot more work to be done to make this record accessible uh, and open. Uh, a lot of Indigenous records still aren't that open, uh, or a lot of colonial records on Indigenous peoples aren't, uh, haven't been opened yet, and that's still the ongoing work at the NCTR. But, um, you know, it used to be standard, and I've seen this in, in various, uh, you know, official government documents like these Indian agent handbooks where they would be given directions on how to suppress and how to quell and, and just all of the general notions of cultural superiority um, within that. But, uh, you know, it's, there's lots of, um, there, are, there are lots of documents out there. Uh, so again, I'd, I'd check out the NCTR and dig through there. Um, I'm not too sure if it came up too much actually in the TRC's reports or not. I, if you were going to look, I would check out volume two uh, of the history report because that's probably where it's going to pop up a little bit more. Um, and those are available at the NCTR as well. And you can just control F in there. So if you, even if you could just, just you know control F and search for music. Um, and then any, any citation that you find will be a document that you can request from the archive. So. Yeah, there's a lot of research to be done in this area. I think it's it's a it's an important area, and and just the whole history of indigenous music in the country is a really important area of uh, documentation that just generally has to happen uh, writ large. Yeah, so. Okay. Well, I think we will uh, conclude there. Uh, as with every session <laughs> this week in Abdullahi, uh, we filled it <laughs> right to the end. Um, which just tells me that he's got such a wealth of knowledge and Rai as well. I mean, it's been, it's been amazing. Thank you both very much for coming. Thank you, thank you for being here. And uh, we look forward to doing this again at some point. And thank you, everyone. Thank mm. you, Vic, for inviting me. Mm. Thank you, Ryan. Oh, yeah, thank <laughs> yeah. you. Thank you. And yeah. yes, thank you for coming. Yeah, that's great. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Thanks so much. laughs> very great.